guys. Cool. So I am a graduate student at Stanford University, um, Ben Stenhaug, and I'll be giving you a little workshop on better measurement with item response theory. Um, raise your hand if you have used item response theory in your work. Cool. Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Cool. Love the interactivity. I am going to try to be as interactive as possible, despite the uh, me being in California and, and you not. Um, the organization of this is you can pull up the slides and the code to produce the slides and basically everything at tinyurl.com slash IRT dash basics. That tiny URL will redirect you to this GitHub site. And maybe I'll just like model how this works because I think it's pretty um, pretty nifty. But basically, I'm presenting off of the presentation here. If you were to click here, you would get the GitHub code that produced said presentation. And if you click here, our Studio Cloud is super, super cool. Um, I don't know if we'll get to it in this, but you'd have the option to open up in our Studio Cloud the code and the data behind everything I'm going to be presenting on. So it's a really nice, I don't know, way to make it interactive potentially for people um, running our code, et cetera. I'll, just to illustrate it to you, I'll click back into the presentation to demonstrate that it, I'm not pulling some magic trick on you. Um, it is actually indeed um, the presentation that we'll, we'll be going through. Um, so I'll start by motivating this and say, so what is the power of item response theory? And then we'll, build up, I'm hoping this will be sort of a low floor, high ceiling workshop that if you know some of this, it's still useful, but we'll also give people an on-ramp if, if you've not heard of item response theory. Um, basically, people respond to items and this can happen in a variety of contexts. Kids can be in schools and we can be asking them math problems. We can be asking people questions about if they like Democrats or Republicans. We can be, you can define a person and an item um, very broadly. And then what does IRT allow you to do? Well, first and foremost, it allows you to understand and leverage the variability in items. So view item one, asking you question two plus two is different than asking you seven plus 19. Asking you if you like public speaking is different than asking you if you like going to parties. And we should be able to tease that out and actually use and understand that variability. Um, at the heart of this whole enterprise, is there some latent construct or some unobservable trait that we are hoping to measure? And so item response theory promises to allow us to make more precise measures of said construct. Um, and sort of those two things combine to make the promise of like, maybe we can squeeze more information out of fewer data points. Um, Mike Frank, who I think you may have heard from this morning, um, has recently fallen in love with these models as well and has used them to do modeling of the word bank data that I'll use as an example throughout this presentation. Um, what you see here is on the x-axis is a child's language ability. And then on the y-axis, you see the probability that they'll recognize that word. And so immediately we can start to see the item variability. If you interpret table, well, high ability students, almost all of them know the word. Low ability students, that's like my uh, educational way of thinking. High ability kids will mostly know the word. Low ability kids will mostly not know the word. Mommy, on the other hand, sort of just seems like every kid knows it. Like it doesn't really, like if you ask a kid that question, do you know mommy or not? It's not going to tell you much about their language development because like every kid knows mommy. Therefore, in some sense, table is then a much better word. It's much more diagnostic than um, the word mommy, if you're trying to understand how much um, language a child understands. So that's sort of some motivation up at the forefront. And now we'll sort of step through and build up what IRT is to hopefully give a good intuition of, of what's actually going on here. And here's our opportunity to get a little bit interactive. I'm giving you some very clear data 
So we have people. There's 10 of them, A through J. They've each responded to three items. Zero represents them getting that item wrong. So person A responded incorrectly to item two. One corresponds to them getting that item right. This is sort of the wide and usual shape of item response data. I would love if take like find your find a partner, find someone ideal you don't know in the room. Um, maybe y'all know each other and answer each of these five questions. I'll give you like five to six to seven minutes. If anyone wants to be brave enough to come up and talk to me about this during the activity, you're more than welcome to. I want this to be a sort of a floor to scaffold us into item response theory. Have fun. <clears throat> It's a correct right. incorrect. Yeah, I'm trying to, 
All right, I want in on the conversation, so let's talk as a as a large group. It sounds like roller coaster tycoon with just a bunch of uh, voices. Will someone someone take question one and tell me their answer? Yeah. Who? So in the in the front row, what's your name? That just said a. Rachel. Yeah. Okay. I'm a key in on, is Rachel the right name? Yes. Okay. There's awesome. No, key in. <laughs> no, this is going to be, like, I want the, the key in on, because this is the, the art of learning. So you said person A was the lowest? That's right. Why, why did you say that? Because they got zero on every item. And then who's the uh, highest ability? Uh, J. Because? Because they got everything right. Seem, seems like good logic. I'm going to ask you one more question. The Let's say there's an item four, and they're about person A and part person J is about to take item four. How sure are you that J will do better than A? Uh, like, yeah. Do I know anything else about item four? Mm, let's say it's similar to item one, two, and three. It's of the they're all math <laughs> problems, two number um, addition. I'll say ninety nine percent sure that Jay will do better. Cool, <laughs> love it. And next to Rachel, what was your name? Alex. Alex. Well, how about for item two? Or question two with reference to hardest and easiest items. Right. Well, the hardest item is the one that the fewest people got right, and that looks to be item two. And then the, uh, and then the easiest one is the one that almost everyone got right, and that's item one. Item one. Got it. So 90% of people got item one right. Pretty easy. I don't know. Six out of – two out of nine people got item two right. We have a missing response, but sort of makes sense. Um and does someone else want to take question three? I think now we're going to get into the more interesting and, and more difficult questions. Well, the best. Mm -hmm. Item three is the best, and item one is the worst. Why is item three the best? Because it's the most. <laughs> <laughs> item three is the best because it's the most discriminative, because it's the most uh, sort of separation into population. Item one is the least informative because almost everybody got it right, so it doesn't really tell you much about people. So when you say item three is most discriminative, are you saying that because only half, like half got it right, half got it wrong, so it discriminates, or is there more to your to your statement? Yeah, I'm assuming that it's not just people guessing. I mean, it could be that that's people guessing, in which case it really doesn't tell you anything at all. Um, you know, assuming you have like a list of like five items, and so there's sort of word entry or something. If it's literally a binary option and there's no information there, so it's not helpful at all. But um, but it also helps that um, A got it wrong and J got it right. Mm. And that's actually exactly where we're going is thinking like there's this weird dance that we're doing between we don't know stuff about people and we don't know stuff about questions, but we can use sort of like back and forth. So like well, person A got item one and two wrong, then it feels good for item three that they also got it wrong. Like it would be weird if for this some reason they were able to get this item right. And similarly with person J, they got both of these right, then they got this right. It feels sort of good. I think we can also pick out slightly odd cases like person I's performance feels a little weird potentially that they were able to get both of these right and then this one was wrong for some reason that you could that you could maybe um think through any other thoughts on that well item two could be depends on what you want it to be the best stat so if you're looking if it's something that gets hard like if it's just a difficulty thing and the one that the fewest people do well on might be the one they care about the most. Mm. So, and then we tell all the people who are not good at your task. Mm. So, to, so item one is easier, so it's probably better at telling low ability people from medium ability people, but item two is harder, 
So it's probably better at deciphering, are you medium ability or are you high ability? Like this, what's the transition from H person to I person and their ability to get that? Like, like we have some cutoff or some, some point that actually I think corresponds basically to like this curve here that we'll be talking about a bunch for the next hour and a half. Like, where is this line? At what ability do you get it wrong if you're lower than that? And right if you're higher than that? is sort of what, what we're getting at. Um, someone give me the think aloud on question four about who's better between person D and, and person I, or or maybe they're the same in, you, in your mind. Can I ask a question about this person? Yeah, of course. Um, is, is, to what extent does all of this assume that there's like some single axis of skill among people, uh, along which people vary versus like the possibility of multiple axes like different bodies of knowledge that people might have, like how, how, how many of these sort of assumptions are, are baked in and how variable is it? Yeah, totally. So like in this exercise, essentially we're assuming that we're talking about some latent trait that is measured by item one, item two, and item three. We're assuming we're in this conversation we're having, I think we're basically all assuming that that latent trait has a single dimension. Like it would change the name of the game very much if I told you that item one was about their ability to sew mittens. Item two was about if they did or didn't drink hot chocolate last year. And item three was if they've been to California. Like then you would be like, I don't really know what you're talking about with ability and probabilities and I don't know why I'd look for relationships across these things. Um, so it's a great framing question. We'll talk for the beginning part in this simple world in which our data was generated with a single latent trait. Each of those items taps into that latent trait, maybe to varying degrees, um, but they are all related. And then at the end, I have a few slides where we can talk about what if it's multidimensional? What if the latent traits have different structures that we want to uncover? And those are all, we can tap into all of those with more complicated item response models. Um, does that make sense? Is there anything more I can say about that that would be helpful? That's perfect, thank you. Cool. Um, someone want to think aloud on four? I want this to be a warm, psychologically safe climate for us to learn with one another. <laughs> Maybe let's say it a different way. Someone make a case for person D having higher ability than person I. Oh, I'm happy to walk through my thinking, but I'm going to make a case for person I. Is that okay? Love, well, love it. Okay, well, I think person I is probably doing better than person D because person I got the really hard item correct. Mm. Item two looks really hard. They got it right. Yeah. Uh, person D got item two wrong. Like, we like item two. Why did you do worse? Um, can we make a point the other, like person D, then if I'm person D, I'm like, yeah, I got item two wrong, but like I got item three right and you didn't. Why is that less compelling? get item three right. It's easier to get item three right because more people got it right. Yeah, that makes sense as a rationale. It's hard to reason. I find item three, I made up this data, so me finding it weird is kind of an odd thing, but item three is odd to look at because it's just like this every other thing. It doesn't have this clear pattern that we have with item one and item two. It's not clear, I mean, Item three could be like the mommy of that previous plot, but just at the 50%, like people just, some people know it, some people don't. It's not really related to ability. We obviously don't have enough data with which to tell the story, but you can imagine if this was 50 items and 10,000 people, we can now estimate parameters that we'll, we'll, we'll scaffold into in a second. Um, someone give me, yeah, hand raised. Then. Please. Um, it's just that if, if I didn't get the hard item correct, and then I got 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 the hard item correct, and then
and item three is such a good um, item for discriminating, maybe that makes us doubt their item two, like maybe they guessed on item two and happened to get that right. Or whereas maybe then we could say that C performed on those passively discriminates and um, so that we could have the better. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I like how you brought in the idea of guessing, because that's going to be an important, like when we're building an item response model, it's going to be an important thing for us to, to capture. Uh, I like framing this question as them like arguing over who's better. And then like person D saying to person I like, hey, you probably guessed item two right. Or like <laughs> vice, <laughs> vice versa. Um, how about five? Does someone have a guess of what they would What's the probability of, of person G getting item two right? It's a missing response right now, so we don't know. Between 10 and 30 percent. Say it once more. Between 10 and 20 percent. Uh, why? It would, because it would be a 20 percent if, uh, if he, uh, uh, so if we just look at other people across item two, and you only have two out of the nine that have filled it out, um, you know, mm. that'd be about 20%. And then if you look across, uh, this person's performance is at about, you know, well, uh, yeah, you have, you have to like weight the other two items by, you know, their, how likely people are to get them right, and then whether this person got them right. It will end up falling somewhere between. Mm, I like it. So but, you've sort of reasoned through two, two ends. The one thing I was compelled to do was to do, can you see my mouth, mouse cursor? Does that work? Yeah. Okay, cool. It's extra big. I've turned it up for, uh, for this, uh, for our purposes here. Um, so G, I was tempted to do some sort of matching to say like, okay, I know their response to item one. I know their response to item three. Let's find people that have the same thing. Okay. So C fits that category. Okay. They got it wrong. So that's zero for one. Who else fits that category? E also fits that category. They match perfectly. They got it wrong. I'm 0 for 2. And then is there someone else? I fits that description. They got it right. So I'm 1 for 3. I found that as, you could say, 33% in that way. We're in much too small of data to actually believe that number, but you can imagine that as a methodology in, in, in larger data sets. Um, oh, yeah. Any other yeah, thoughts before yeah. we move on? That would be rephrased as figure out which two items are, or which item this one is most similar to from the rest of them, correlation wise, and then not just going with that one, or like weighing that one higher in your estimate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's but a lot of approaches here. Your item estimate by its correlation with both item one and item three, I guess. Mm hmm. Um, so, uh, you said you end up at like 30 something percent? I, yeah, I got one out of three. <laughs> I got 33%. Yeah, it's the nearest neighbors of item response theory, I guess. Um, which is kind of cool. Um, anything else people want? So I'm now going to transition from this and sort of scaffold and build up item response theory and walk through what, let's put parameters on these things. Let's talk about how to do this in a modeling framework. But all the intuition that I think we just got applies and that you have to reason through both people and items at the same time. Um, there's different properties of people and or items, like how difficult they are, how discriminating they are, how guessable is something. The people are going to be like or dislike one another based on their item response strings. Items will be like or dislike each other based on who got them right or wrong. So it's all of this sort of this structure of data. And in case you're not aware, this is the most common, I think of this as a wide format. This is the most common way that you see item response data represented and then fed into software that will fit the item response models, where each row is a person and then each column is an item. You simply place zeros or ones to correspond to correct or incorrect, or if you're in a different setting to yes or affirmative and no or negative, um, add more columns on as I get more items. Um, you can imagine the opposite way is the long format where each 
row, the first row is person A, item one, then zero, and then it just gets really, really long, and you only have three columns for person, item, and then response. Um, thoughts, questions before I keep going? Well, let's talk about the name of the game. So in general, we're talking about measurement and I do find it useful to think about physical measurement with a ruler. Um, I can ask how tall someone is and that's a well-defined question that we can answer very precisely. We're doing a different type of measurement where we're interested in a latent construct, for example, math ability, how extroverted you are, how much anxiety you feel, are you depressed, like um, your language ability, do you know things, your propensity to live in cold play, like, you can define a latent construct in any way. The hard thing about latent construct is it doesn't live in this physical space. It lives in people's minds and personalities in a way that the only way we can get at it is with questions or observed behaviors or um, what we'll generally refer to as items. Um, and that's the way we get at the measure of the latent construct. But it's sort of this indirect process that physical measurements uh, whereas physical measurement is a quite direct process. As terminology, I'm going to refer to like people respond to items. That collection of items is referred to as a test, which sort of has a educational connotation, but it doesn't have to. You can similarly imagine a survey of political leaning. You can imagine sort of psychological instruments, you can imagine anything, but I'll just refer to it collectively as items. Maybe the more general term is instrument. That feels too fancy for me, so I'll, I'll call it a test. And then I have this thing I care about. I get at it indirectly with the items that form the test. And then basically what we want to do is some science with that measurement. Are males different than females according to this latent construct? Does this latent construct change when I do this thing? Does you can ask thousands and thousands of questions, but my science will be better if I have a better, better measurement of the latent construct. Um, questions come up during this process. Is this a good test? Which basically means, is this test related to the latent construct I'm interested in? Are some of the items better than others? As a teacher, I wrote a test of 40 questions Maybe five of them actually are the best questions. Maybe I should just ask my kids five questions and then we can move on with our day because those five questions give me a good assessment of the, of the measure. Um, related is this, does this test measure the latent construct I care about? This comes up in education in a lot of ways. I ask word problems on a math test. Have I just measured your math ability or have I measured your ability to read the paragraph and understand the math question that I'm asking you. And we need to be really careful about these things if we're gonna make decisions about if kids should go into further math classrooms or if I'm gonna make arguments that I've measured something about your language ability, but actually I've measured um, something else. Fairness becomes a gigantic deal, which you can say specifically as if two students or two people from different groups have the same ability, they ought to have the same probability of getting yes on each item in the, in the test. Um, it's not fair if students across groups have different relationships with the exam and there's a whole history of that potentially being the case and arguments uh, about that. And then the specific question that we're gonna dive into is, I give people a test, how do I move from their responses to my measure of the latent trait. And so I've taken the same data as, as we were just reasoning through and talking about. And let's say these are children and let's say they do or don't recognize each of these words. I want for each child a measure of their language ability. And so I need to do something, I need to do something that maps this zero, this zero, and this zero to a single measure, let's assume it's united, unidimensional, of this child's language ability. And I don't know, do people have thoughts on what, what's the easiest thing you could possibly do? 
Average them. Average them. This person got a 0%. This person yeah. got a 66%. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. And this is what psychologists, uh, I mean, everyone has been doing for ever. Um, it's known more commonly as like the sum score. This is how I think we were all graded in schools growing up. I asked you 10 questions. You got eight of them correct. You got an eight out of 10. You have an eight. I just added up rights and wrongs. Um, I want to think though, so and when we use a sum score for this mapping from responses to the latent trait, what assumptions are we making? And then what limitations does this mapping have? I'm going to put this back up because I think it's more provocative and gets you thinking a little bit more. But basically, I do sum score, so I give 0, 2, 1, 2, 1. What are the assumptions? 1. And then 2, what are the limitations with this methodology? Um, talk with the, the same group of people you were talking with for a minute or two about those two questions. <laughs> Assumptions, let's bring it back together. The assumptions of the sum score, someone list off a couple of them. Uh, equal weighting and IID questions. Yep, great. There's a weighting thing. Other assumptions that people came up with? Or limitations? They come to the same group. If all questions are weighed equally, then we're assuming that all these children would have the same behavior. So you can have like like the, the, the I guess the the trans what's, what's that term? Like the the hate the hate term? Hate that one. But whatever. The so important thing is that you can have something that doesn't speak English. Mm -hmm. They could have guessed, right? And so they come from a different group. And so weighing these equally doesn't let you get into that and tap into that. Yeah, it's a I it's mean, a really good point. Guess, guess, yeah, but you can assume maybe maybe not guess. Maybe there's some structure to the behavior or actually some questions. 
if you search international and they saw TV, they heard mommy more than trash, right? So this equal weighting doesn't allow us to glimpse at that with the groups that these children come from. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I do not take into account anything here. And I especially can't allow different children to function differently with regard to the items. Um, more thoughts? Is there a hand in the back? I think it's also um, kind of similar to the uh, example where like, maybe one of the parents doesn't speak English. So like just having a sum of them, um, they might actually know those concepts, but maybe not in English. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, so this is like a core on ability, like actually might not fully um, encapsulate their knowledge or understanding of those terms, even though like you might think it does make some of the practice. Yeah, how cool would it be if we had another column here of if their if English was their native language, and then I could somehow sort of tease apart the relationship between students and items as a function both of their ability and of if English was their first language. And we'll get there. And it's definitely, I agree, not something the sum score allows us to really gain any leverage on. Um, other thoughts, limitations? Does the sum score let us do anything to impute or make a prediction here? Like, not really, right? I don't feel like I have, I actually don't even know what to do with child G. Seems like I could give them a one and assume if they didn't answer yesterday, they didn't know it. Seems like I could give them a two and give them the benefit of a doubt. Or maybe I give them like a one and a half and say, eh, I don't know, maybe there's a 50% chance you would have gotten it right. Well, that seems unfair. Maybe there's a two ninths chance you got it right because that's what everyone else says. None of those assumptions feel very good for giving child G a... Uh, a score or a ability measure. And so I think we essentially got this, but I we're assuming that they're all of equal relationship to the latent construct. That's the equal weighting. We're not taking into account anything to do with difficulty. As people pointed out, maybe it's better to get a hard item right, but we're not able to take that into account. And then the third thing I've sort of told you here that one is always good, but you can imagine many cases with possible reverse encodings, or we don't know how responding yes or no relates to the latent measure. And here, I have to always assume that one is positively associated with the latent measure and zero is sort of negatively associated or uh, like people that say zero or respond with zero have a lower ability. That seems like kind of a big assumption, especially if I have thousands of items or different cases like that. And then we got at it with person child G, I think. There's no clear way to handle missing data with the sum score. There's definitely no clear way to make predictions for, I asked, I think, Rachel, what would happen on item four. Sum score doesn't give us any leverage on that. I believe Rachel in 99%, but maybe there's a slightly more sophisticated way we can um, generate said prediction. Um, and we won't dive much into this, but there's also this idea of an adaptive test. Can I give you the best question for my current estimate of your ability? And that's not something I can do with, with a sum score, really. So hopefully at this point, I've convinced you that the sum score and just reasoning through item response matrices is not the best way to go. And this is the point at which I say item response theory, parenthetical IRT to the rescue. It gives us a parametric framework with which we can model this item response data and we'll scaffold up what those parameters are. So each person has an ability, we we'll use the term theta P to say this is that person's ability. We'll assume for now that this theta is a, a single dimension so that that ability can be captured with just uh, a scalar. But you can imagine having a model where this theta is a vector of five different dimensions, the big five personality traits or something like that. Um, and you can estimate their ability along each of these dimensions. Again, we'll stick with it being a scalar for now. And then in the simplest version of things, each item also needs a parameter and we'll call that its easiness B sub I. So if 
B is higher, the item's easier. If B is lower, the item's harder. If theta's higher, the person's better or has more of the latent trait and lower they don't. And then now what we need is a way to take these two parameters and put them together to create a probability of correct response. A person with ability P theta responds to an item with easiness B, what is their probability of answering the question correct? And sort of the magic answer in the history of item response theory is the use of this logistic function. Feed in the sum of ability and easiness into this function, and if you think, if you reason through the logistic function or you're familiar with it, it will always produce a number between 0% or, and 100% or one. Here's actually exactly how this ends up looking. So x-axis, the sum of their ability and item easiness. Maybe the person has ability one and the item has easiness one. So now we're here. In that case, we would say the person has an 87.5% chance of getting the item correct. Maybe the item easiness is minus two and the person ability is two, sums to zero. Now let's say if they take that item, they have a 50% chance of getting that item correct. Does that make sense? Any questions or thoughts at this point? Cool, you all seem happy. The And more commonly, I've drawn this here as the sum. More commonly, we'll put the person ability on the x-axis. And then for each item, we can draw a curve corresponding to the easiness. So if the item easiness is two, it's over here. This is an easier item. One way to reason through this is to think, okay, if I'm a person with ability zero, my probability of getting the item with easiness two right is up here. My probability of getting the item with easiness zero right is here. My probability of getting the item easiness negative two right is down here. And so you really can think about this as being a horizontal translation, the item easiness is. Um, of this, what we call the item characteristic curve, which maps ability onto the probability of correct. Um, I'll give you like a minute to think on your own because I want to keep going. But just to be sure we're after this. So this correct corresponds to this item, this correct corresponds to this item, and this correct corresponds to this item. Think for like 30 seconds or a minute about what is the probability of these three responses for a person with ability zero. And then you can update and think it through for a person with ability one. For the sake of time, we'll keep going and I'll feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have questions or, or anything. I'll walk through how I'm thinking of this to be sure we're on the same page. But so ability zero, correct, is 87.5% on the first one, 50% on the second one. And then what's the probability of incorrect here? So that's 12.5% of them getting it right, but it's then 87.5% of them getting it wrong. If I want the sort of, I need to assume, there's an assumption here that each response is independent, so then I can multiply those three probabilities together, and then I get the probability of this full response string for this ability. Similarly, I can go over here and for ability one, I can say, okay, now we're here, grab the probabilities, and 
walk through what would be the probability of those three things. Um, I'm doing everything in R here, so I've written this logistic, I've named it a function that does not come along in, in R, but we have it. And here's how I've done the first one. So take the logistic of two, um, remember it was item easiness two, and we said the ability was zero. We're summing those and then applying the logistic function. Multiply it by if the item easiness was zero instead, I, and then multiply it by one minus, because they got it wrong, the item easiness being minus two. And we say, okay, the probability of these three responses for someone with this ability is 38.8%. Similarly, we can do the exact same exercise, but imagine instead that person has ability one. What gets changed is the person's ability goes from zero to one in each of these. Everything else stays the same in the expression. And now I actually have a 51% chance of observing the data. And we won't go into any great detail in parameter estimation. I've told you that people have abilities and items have easinesses, but how do I get those? Hoping this gives some clue, we use maximum likelihood estimation. So if this person had this response, we would rather them have ability one than ability zero because it's more likely. You could check ability two, you could check ability 1.5, there's more advanced ways to do the estimation. But basically we find the ability that gets plugged in here that maximizes the likelihood of their responses. Now, we're assuming we know the item easinesses. That's not the case usually, right? We're trying to estimate both at the same time. I don't know the item easinesses or the person abilities going into it. So I have this sort of tricky back and forth problem that I have to do, but hopefully there's some intuition available here. Yeah, go ahead. Did you use expectation maximization in practice? Is that like... Yeah, exactly. It's an EM algorithm application um, where you go back and forth. That It gets more complicated than this. What people actually do is they marginalize over an ability distribution. Um, they assume abilities come from normal zero one integrate that out and optimize the item parameters typically, and then fix those item parameters and go estimate the abilities, um, which that method works perfectly and is super efficient when abilities do indeed come from that distribution that you've marginalized out. It becomes fraught, but that's not the case. Um, Pause here and just say like who uses this. So PISA, which is the whole enterprise that says the United States is, I don't know, 24th in the world and uh, most things uses this at the foundation. Every state test, um, kids take an end of year exam. They're said if they're held back, the state decides if teachers should make more in some cases, IRT all the way, GRE, basically any educational test in medium to high stakes IRTs used. Um, examples elsewhere, like when you try to get your driver's permit, there's an IRT underneath that when you're responding to those questions. Um, and then it's becoming increasingly common in, in other fields as well. Psychology has been using it forever, sort of coinciding with um, education and health surveys, economics. It's sort of used everywhere and we'll return to those uses later. Now what I'm going to walk through is an actual um, estimation and doing this procedure with actual data. So I've downloaded and imported and if you were to click here available to you in an RStudio instance is this word bank data where I basically have a bunch of kids, I have their age in months, and then for a ton of words I have if they've, I think it's if they've have you the parent reports if the child has used that word or not this 27th 27 month female child has used yum yum has not used any of these but has used ouch and aunt and so on and so forth and so this is a perfect place for us to use IRT to both understand these words and when kids start to use them and their relationship and then for each kid, we should also be able to understand 
how much of the latent construct of language development they have. I filtered to just these eight words that we'll actually walk through the IRT process with. And the first thing that people look at as sort of a descriptive tool is what percent of the kids are using the word. Basically for each column, what percent is one and zero? Not to use as, as just as some understanding. So in this data set, moo is the most common word and camping is the least common word that, that kids are using. Ouch and yum yum, sh a little bit behind moo. Uh, cockle doodle doo and, and be somewhere in the middle. The data set's pretty fun. So um, thanks to Mike Frank for all of the effort there. We can also look at the sum score and we can look at the distribution of um, sum score by, by sex. The, in this process, like the way I always do it is I do this sum score and I do this thing, but as like a descriptive piece before I go and do the actual item response modeling, um, you get a nice distribution of some kids know all eight, some kids don't know any, most are, are somewhere in the middle. Looks like the distribution across sex is um, pretty, pretty similar. Maybe females a little bit higher, a little bit more sevens and, and, and eights. Um, I'll show just a quick show of hands. Who uses R in the room? As like a, like a half and half. The, is Python like a, the alternative that people use or stay there or SPSS? Yeah, go ahead. Python, that's the, that's the raise for Python. I will walk through the how to do this in R because Mert's a really good package that's been written, but there are packages also available and I think any software. I've taken, I'm applying the English words, that's the data frame that contains this. I feed into this, I don't give it the sex or the age, I'm just giving it the item response matrix, which is why I'm removing those two columns Model equals one says that theta dimension is going to have um, a length one. It'll be unidimensional. Item type is Rosh. We'll talk more about that, but that basically means it's just going to be an item easiness. And then verbose is not going to do anything. The item parameter estimation then happens as a result of calling this function. It's the marginal maximum likelihood estimation that I was referencing earlier. And by assuming that students ability is drawn from a normal zero one distribution, it can then marginalize over and estimate the item easinesses for each item, which are then plotted here. And they're a little bit hard, like these plots are nice because they're intuitive of like, here's the latent trait on the X axis and then here's the probability on the Y axis, I think has a really clear intuitive interpretation find it hard to make comparisons across these. Like each of these has a different easiness. I guess you can see that camping is harder here. It seems shifted to the right. Um, Moo, we should be able to see is shifted to the left. And that's sort of what we're looking at when we're fitting these, these item parameters. Um, I can then go back. So with these item parameters fixed, then for each child, I can go back and do the maximum likelihood estimation of their theta and I've done Rosh because it's according to this model. And we can look at for each kid, what is that maximum likelihood estimate of their ability? And as you can see here, and as should be expected, it corresponds positively with their sum score. This student, this kid knew seven of eight, they got a 2.32. This kid knew only three, they got negative 0.8383, uh, et cetera. Um, and that's the that's the process. Any questions? Again, we can look at that distribution with these theta estimates by sex. One thing you might have noticed here is I sort of tried to build this up as like, wow, we shouldn't be using the sum score. Let's fit this parametric framework called item response theory. But then the two student, the two kids that both got three right, and they had different response patterns, both ended up getting the exact same ability estimate. And if I plot the relationship between sum score and the relationship between the ability according to this Rosh estimate, 
I get this perfect one-to-one -one correspondence. And so I've really gained nothing by fitting this model in terms of the measurement of the latent trait. It's nice, I have a statistical framework in which I can make predictions, et cetera, but there's still this perfect relationship. And the reason there's that perfect relationship is because items have only a single parameter, which is this easiness. And that's referred to as the Rosh or the 1PL, 1PL um, uh, referring to the one parameter logistic model. Here's the model that we had just fit. The thing that seems a little bit more exciting is let's add in a second item parameter, and call it the 2PL then. And so in addition to items having easiness, each item will have a discrimination, which gets multiplied by the student's or the person's ability. And then that sigmoid function um, or the logistic function gets applied. And so what this discrimination parameter allows us is for each item, it should, that item has a different relationship with the latent construct theta. And the strength of that relationship is encapsulated in this discrimination parameter um, A sub I. Thoughts or questions at this point? Are, <clears throat> cool. Are these two parameters, are these two parameters uh, are they independent? Easiness and discrimination? Um, yes. Yes, in this, they're statistically independent in that if you like simulate data and estimate, you will not get a relationship between these. In most empirical data sets, they are not independent in that it is the case that typically um, harder items seem to discriminate better more often. And you'd sort of, and we'll look at a plot looking at the relationship in this context in just a couple of minutes where we can kind of think through that too. So as I've said, we have this parameter, describes the strength of the relationship between item and ability um, to build some a little bit more intuition. Let's plot this curve for items of different discriminations. Let's say all of these have easiness zero. The red curve is an item with discrimination 0 0.5. It's flatter. Discrimination of zero would be perfectly flat. Everyone just has a 50% chance of getting it right. And then as I increase that discrimination from 0 0.5 to one, and then from one to two, and then looks like I haven't I've cut it off, but then from two to three, I get this sort of sharpening of the curve where in general, you think of items with higher discrimination as being better because they more precisely discriminate between students or people of low ability and students or people of high ability. Um, basically, by the time we get to this purple curve, if you get this item right, we know your ability is better than zero, or we at least know it's better than one for sure. Whereas for the red item, it's a little bit less clear. Even if you get the item right, I even, I've learned something about where you are. You're more likely to be over here, but it's definitely still possible. Like people with ability of negative five still get this item right sometimes. So I've learned a little bit less. Um, and so high discrimination items are, are, are in general better. Um, I don't think we have time to fully sort of walk through this, this exercise, but I still think I can give you the, the intuition here. If I have four items, um, each with these discriminations, 0.5, 1, 2, and 3, and then let's say I call these outcomes, but you can imagine these students, um, of getting correct and then incorrect and then incorrect and correct or, or correct, correct, incorrect. Basically, the question becomes here, is it better to get these two items wrong, the items with discrimination one and the items with discrimination two, or would it be better to get three out of four items 
but I've gotten the last question, the one with the highest discrimination wrong. And if you walk through the math, it's exactly the same. Like the likelihood of those outcomes becomes exactly the same because this discrimination acts as a weight, um, which sort of propagates down through the, through the likelihood. And so if you use a 2PL model, the couple of other hand-waving things, you would find that these two students or these two outcomes have the same ability, which I think allows you to start getting intuition for discrimination encapsulating relationship between latent variable and probability. And then also correspondingly, it can be thought of as a weight on the importance of different, of different items. This item's three times more important than, than this item when it comes to giving students grades in a maximum likelihood framework. So going back to that word bank data can fit this model just by running the exact same code in R um, using the MERT package, but instead calling the item type to be the 2PL. And I can then produce the same item trace lines. If you inspect closely, you'll notice that now the slope does vary a little bit. I think probably most obviously on Yum Yum, it's a little bit more flattened. And then like B, for example, is a very, very steep, steep slope for having a very high discrimination. Um, this gets at the question that was asked between discrimination and difficulty. For each of the items, now let's plot its discrimination parameter and its easiness parameter and take a look. And so, Anyone have anything they notice here? It seems like when you design a test, you would want to favor the questions with high discrimination, but then when you design a sort of set of questions for an individual, you would want a spread of easiness. Like high discrimination seems universally preferred, but then you want to get some have a diagnostic test, you then want to spread the easiness out or in some way control that. Is that reasonable intuition? Yeah, that's perfect intuition. The two plus two is a super good, super high discriminating question. It's also of really high easiness. If I ask right everyone in this room, two plus two, despite its high discrimination, I've learned nothing about us because we're sort of misaligned on the easiness, right? Um, yeah, that's exactly the intuition. You want these items at different intervals of easiness with high discrimination. And then ideally, if it's high enough, as soon as you get that item right, okay, I know you're above that. Now let me find a high discriminating item that I know you're below that and I can keep sort of updating. This is exactly what a computer adaptive test will do or a sort of experiment adaptive experiments will do, um, basically trying to maximize the information gained on the individual by choosing items at their ability with high discrimination. Right, it's like a, it's like a binary search or decision tree sort of partitioning your, your participants' questions. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And you can get the adaptive test thing is huge and adaptive experiment thing is huge because you can imagine how much like if a high school kid sits down and they take 10 questions that are all like about high school math, but of varying difficulty, there's probably only one or two questions in there that's like actually pretty well targeted to them. But if I can spend a couple of questions figuring out where they are and then ask them seven questions on systems of linear equations that are like right at their skill level, I can very, very precisely determine sort of their mathematical ability. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of, ton of power there. Um, we shouldn't over index on these. All of these discriminations are pretty high. Think of any time the discrimination is at least one it's decently high. Two is like really good. And like B is super, super high. So the fact that 
B is so much higher. I don't know, like I have some great intuition for child language development to map that onto why B is way better than yum yum. Um, or the relationships here. Um, I find this to be a good way to map items and to sort of get a sense for them. And the thing you would probably do from like one and a half or 1.3 is still good. But if you have items that are low discriminating as the test designer, or instrument designer, you then go look at those items. And oftentimes they're confusingly written. They, the prompt is weird. Maybe if there's a language translation, it's bad because any confusion, it's going to drop the discrimination because even high ability students will potentially be susceptible to, to that confusion. Um, when we move to the 2PL, now it matters which questions or which words students or children recognized. So now it's more than, it's almost three times better to recognize B in terms of your score than it is to recognize yum yum in terms of your score. And so now we've broken this perfect mapping from the sum score and the, your, our measure of your latent trait. Whereas there are some students that got four out of eight correct that have higher abilities than students that got five out of eight correct. Um, the reason being they got the high discriminating items right and these students got the high discriminating items wrong. There's lots of interesting arguments to have about that. People will argue from a fairness standpoint that seems weird. From an information or a likelihood standpoint, it makes perfect sense because we know some of these questions are more or less related to the latent trait we're trying to we're trying to measure. So that was the two parameter model. What's the third parameter going to be? It came up earlier. How discriminate? Like how good a person is at discriminating the items? Like the reverse of what hmm. we have so far. That's really interesting. You could have. Yeah, I don't know how quite how you like he put that in the model. I think it's even simpler than that. Any other guesses? Guessing's fine. So it's going to be an item whether parameter. Not, whether or not you have a certain piece of knowledge or something, like some some reflection of the context. That's cool too. It's more advanced than the third item parameter is going to do. This is a uh, people respond to questions. What could happen? Why? Why might they get it right? Well, they might. Attention. They might it's guess. How is that different from discrimination? So, well, I wish I had a. So let's look at this and then I'll go backwards to answer your question. Guessing, so this green item has a guessing parameter of, I don't know, let's call that 40%. And so the way you define guess at your guessability is for a person of ability negative infinity, what's their probability of getting the item right? So it determines the starting point of this curve. Discrimination determines the slope of the curve at the point at which, at its difficulty level or at its easiness level. So on this graph, this green line is a high guessability, 40%, low discrimination because this slope is pretty low. And it looks relatively hard because even someone like here, well, you kind of have to think through the guessingness of it, but the shifting happens after having taken into account that. I'm trying to think, is this hard or easy? Well, person ability zero. It's like a pretty hard item because being at zero doesn't get me even much above what someone at negative infinity is at. I've compared this here to this red curve, which is a low guess ability. So I think this is 10% or something. And then looks more likely the curves we were looking at before where it's got high discrimination and then a level of, of easiness. The way this happens in the math is before we had this logistic of 
the discrimination times your ability plus the easiness. Now we're going to say there's some probability, GI, of you just guessing it right. And that probability is completely unrelated to your ability. Everyone gets this. And then let's say this is 40%. And then for the other 60%, one minus the guessability, you have your probability of getting it right as determined by that logistic function that we are already studying, which is related both to your ability and then the item discrimination and the item easiness. Does that make sense from an intuition standpoint? Is there more I can say to, to be helpful there? Let's fit it. Here's what we get. Which item is the one that, that was guessable? I don't understand why, because in this case, it's not the kid making a guess about what me means, right? It's just the parent. Mm. The parent is box about whether they think the child knows it. So is the, is the parent guessing? Like what? Yeah, it's a great point. And this data set's complicated it since the, Ida, the parents are reporting on the kids' knowledge or use. So I guess it would be, what's the odds? So Let's look at Mu is the one that appears guessable empirically looking at this. And so there's some kids in the data set that have, there's some scores zero out of eight or one out of eight. They have a really low language development ability. So now it's, what's the probability that the parents are accidentally gonna be like, oh, my kid knows the word Mu when they actually don't know the word Mu. That's the mapping in this concept. Now, why would that happen? Not sure, y'all might have a better guess than, than I do, but that's sort of the what the parameter's doing in this. Having filled out the survey before, I can say that I guess on a lot of the words, right? Like, I bet you could say new. Like, you probably could, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're supposed to do that. <laughs> Where they make a sound that sounds like moo, and you're like, that's totally a word. Yeah. <laughs> like moo, they make a lot of noises. I don't know. Like, like it makes sense to me camping. Like, camping's pretty clear, right? I don't accidentally think my kid knows the word camping, but they... <laughs> like, like, there's no... So, yeah. And may, I'm not sure if this is a perk or a downside of this example data set, but we do have this additional level... Where it's with a multiple choice question, it's obvious. There's four options. Each kid, even if you don't know it, you have a one in four chance of putting C in it being C. That makes perfect sense in that in that case. Um, here's empirically, again, just as an example, each of the item parameters. A1 refers to the discrimination. We have a one there because if we were to do a multi-dimensional latent space, then we would have A1, A2, A3, each of those telling you how much that ability, that dimension of ability is in relationship to the, the probability of response. We have the easiness. And then in this case, it looks like aunt is slightly guessable. I don't know, but moo is the one that stands out as guessable. And it does, if we looked at the comparison to the old item parameters, it does change these item parameters because now before in the 2PL, anytime you got it right, I had to assume you knew the answer. Now in the 3PL, if you get it right, I have some wiggle room to say, you're actually still really low ability. You just got lucky here or your parents mistook your babbling for the knowledge of the, the word that, that cows make. Um, this shows up if anytime you look at the relationship, each of these is a kid and their ability 
as measured by the 2PL model compared to as measured by the 3PL model, you see really high agreement for the higher ability students because guessability doesn't really affect our measures at the high end of the spectrum. Anytime a kid gets it right, we're going to say you were probably high ability. You got probably got it right for some reason. But down here, if before you had some ability, uh, according to the 2PL, I might attribute you getting one or two of them right as guessing, especially on the, the, the word mu in, in this case. Um, to go all the way back to our motivation on the student side of things, it was a comparison between this sum score and then what's the measure according to this model. Here's that relationship. Anytime you get zero or eight, we have every kid in that bucket gets the same score because we can't disentangle all zeros look the same, all ones look the same. But in between, as we've talked about, which items now you've gotten right uh, matters. And getting the higher discriminating items right in particular matters the most. And then there's some guessing that, that plays with that too. Now we can do the science, whatever we might want. One example is we can look at the distribution compared by sex of their 3PL parameters. Um, I'm looking at the relationship here between the age and months and the average sum score and the average um, ability as estimated by the 3PL. You'll notice here the relationships very, very, very similar um, between the sum score and the 3PL. And this is this is quite common, especially when you do averages at like, this is a bucket of 20 month year olds and they're getting averaged all across. It's very common that the relationships look the same. IRT is really providing value when we're trying to look at an individual student compared to another individual student. And also now we have this functional form that we can uh, make predictions on, say things about the item parameters. Um, it's, it's all connected into a framework that, that is useful. Um, I'm going to go over a couple of, are there any questions before I keep going the way? I think we have 19 minutes left. Is that right? Yeah. 19. So I have a few things. I'll just talk about a couple of other sort of slightly more advanced IRT things. And then we can talk for a few minutes. Is there anything that we've gone over so far that people want to talk about before I hit you with a couple of slightly more advanced topics? Question. Um, I used to, I learned to analyze this type of zero one stuff with the logistic regression. So could you speak to the difference between this and logistic regression? Because they both seem to use the logistic function. Mm -hmm. um, a logistic regression is you are basically getting the exact you're basically fitting a Rosh model with a logistic regression. I actually think that Rosh comes from the logistic regression model where when you do that, I'm guessing you're estimating a fixed effect for uh, ability and you're estimating a fixed effect for each item that fixed effect for ability or you're doing a fixed effect for students, which is basically ability in this. This is exactly the linking function used in logistic regression. Um, the only difference is in this model and the way it's usually fit is the person ability is thought to be a random effect, which you could do with like a mixed effects model um, because we're imagining abilities being drawn from a normal zero one distribution to say slightly too much in the, if you imagine people have a, there's a test and that test grows to infinity in terms of the number of students taking it, you would hope that you would have consistency, which means these parameters sort of converge to their true values as we go to infinity. And statisticians in the I don't know, 70s or 80s showed that this model is inconsistent, which is why they started to think of this as being a random effect drawn from a normal distribution because it buys you consistency. Probably said too much, but follow-up questions or thoughts? Yeah, we usually do random plus and random effects for both subjects and items. 
the so if you do a random effect for items, you're gonna get this. It's like putting a normal prior on it. You're gonna get this shrinking. So if an item was of easy, easiness six, well, you have this random effect with shrinks. You'll probably get a random effect of like three or four, um, which I think hurts your estimate when you do it for both. Um, so in general, I don't think you want to do a random effect. You're probably noticing sort of the symmetry here, which is you can basically call items students in students items. The only real difference is usually you have many more students than you have items, which is why it makes a little bit more sense to think of students as coming from a distribution. So that's not the case with like some sort of population or anything. This is just an incidence of what you're looking at. <clears throat> How many subjects versus items you have, right? I mean, I don't know. In terms of the, the you know, processes that generate your subjects and uh, your items. I don't know that there's any systematic way to distinguish. Um, yeah. So to what extent is your determination of whether something is a fixed or random effect uh, just for your statistical purposes uh, at this current time or versus uh, assumptions about the population in general? That's something that I've never been fully clear on. Uh, and I guess, I don't know, does that make sense of question? Say, say it one more time. Um, so what you say that, you know, you have, uh, you're drawing items from, you know, uh, or subject. Which one did you say that you're drawing from around the distribution and you? So you could, yeah, or you have many more in one case of one or the other. That's, that all seems uh, 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 incidental to your content, right? How many items you have or how many subjects. Yeah. And the, and the processes themselves, by their nature of like generating subjects versus generating items, I guess, those don't uh, have anything inherent in them to determine how many, like what sort of distribution you're from. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying. The typical way to think of it is that students come from a distribution, whereas I think it's slightly less intuitive to think of there being some distribution of items. Like there's some universe of all of the possible math questions. And then I've drawn, I've, I have 20 questions I'm asking students, but I've happened to sample 20 of those from this universe of questions. It seems like slightly less in line with how I think about the world. I'm more in line to think of students as coming from just some distribution and then. And if you go to the topic of corporate analysis, it becomes completely natural to think of it that way. Say, say where, wh when does it become completely natural? When you go to corporate analysis. Um, totally. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, um, I, my thinking comes from the educational world where someone writes math questions, but totally in, in other areas, I think random item effects or viewing them being a population. Uh, makes much, much more sense. Thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to see where these models get applied in the future because I think there is a lot of power and they're quite flexible. Yeah. It's a decent, decent example of such. Um, any other thoughts or questions? I will give you, go over a couple of other sort of things that come up in item response theory, but I'm happy to answer anything on, on y'all's mind as priority before that. So there's a couple of other topics that happen all the time is, first would be differential item functioning. So we spent all this time talking about there being some curve, the logistic function with one, two, or three parameters that maps ability to probability. Um, differential item functioning says, let's look at that curve for different groups of students. I think came up in, in this example was, did you learn it English as your first language or did you learn it as not your first language? And we call anytime this curve does isn't the same for two groups. We refer to that most generally as differential 
item functioning. Um, more particularly, if you're a little bit more careful about what's happening, you might call that bias or um, item bias at the item level. And the way to see that is for a student of ability zero, well, if they're in what we're generally calling the reference group, they have a higher probability of getting it right than the, if they're in the focal group. Now, that's biased because they have the same ability, which means they should have the same probability if this, if we're fully capturing everything that's going on here, this probability should be the same. But when we draw these two curves, they don't line up. Um, this, more generally, this is basically saying our ability there's some dimension to our ability that we're not fully capturing. The example that happened, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, most common was tests, educational tests would ask about golf or something that only rich kids were more likely to, um, to see. And then they would make this graph for rich and poor kids. And they would say, hey, the golf questions, the rich kids do especially better on and the poor kids do especially bad on. Now, we call it differential item functioning would frame like this. If you fit the right model, you would pick up, hey, I have a multi-dimensional ability vector. The first dimension is um, math ability, but the second dimension is your SES of your parents. And wow, some items have really high relationships between getting the item right and the SES of your parents. In either framing, it's not a good question if your goal is to measure that first um, first ability dimension, which is, is your mathematical ability. Um, yeah. And the other nice thing about IRT is it gives you this full framework in which to examine this sort of question of bias. Thoughts, feelings, or, or, or comments before we go to the next IRT topic? We've talked only about um, dichotomous item responses, but similarly, there's a whole class of models um, with different assumptions uh, for polytomous item responses. So here's a question that's scored on a zero, one, two, three, or four scale. And now this polytomous item response model has mapped each ability onto the probability of you landing in each of these five buckets. So for someone of ability zero, their probability of getting zero and their probability of getting four are both about 5%. But as I go up, their probability of getting one out of four is here and their probability of getting two or three is here. And you sort of have these crossover points, um, which is one par parameterization of, of this model. Um, and th these can be really cool, especially for surveys. You can imagine this being a Likert serve, uh, a Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And this is somewhere in the middle. And all of the same benefits that we were talking about before of you can investigate bias, you can look at relationships between ability and item parameters, etc. apply here. You need quite, not quite, you need a fair bit amount more data um, to estimate these models well because you're, you're estimating many more parameters for each question. In particular, you're estimating the crossover points from what? each category to each category. And we're getting any more subjects or any more, more subjects, right? Yeah, more subjects. It's the relationship of how many subjects do I have for each question. It helps me um, do the parameter estimation. And then I think this is where it gets really fun for um, measurement and like figuring out the relationships of latent constructs, et cetera. You can basically specify any type of latent space you want and any type of mapping of that latent space onto the items. So here's a model where you say, okay, there were six items and ability is a vector of two dimensions, but theta one actually determines item one, two, and three and theta two determines four, five, and six. And theta two doesn't, like being higher on this, doesn't affect at all your ability to get item two right or wrong. Someone else might come in and be like, 
I don't know. This is a weird view of the world. Like, I bet if you're better at theta two, you'd probably be better at theta uh, at item two. And so they might draw this graph, right? Where in here, I guess theta two taps into every item or each of the items tap into theta two except for item one. But you can basically draw these graphs in, in any way you want. And it's a very specific way of presenting a hypothesis about the relationship between the items you have and the latent trait that you're trying to measure. What's cool about this is now you can make theoretical arguments, but you can also make empirical arguments. You can fit both of these item response models, and then you can do a model comparison. And I can show you, hey, this model actually fits this data better than this model. And then from that, we can back out what we think that means in terms of the science. But it gives, I think, a very clear way in which we can have conversations about, about latent um, traits. Does that make sense? Kind of cool, right? Yeah. Let's gonna talk in detail about, well, let's say a couple of things that I think are just interesting that come up in the news. In 2015, so I think the 2018 PISA just came out, which you probably saw some, some news reports about the, the updated country rankings. What's really interesting, in 2015, they switched from using the ROSH to using the 2PL model for grading the items. And that's sort of a detail just buried in the statistical report. But it's actually fascinating, because as soon as I moved to the 2PL, now I'm not weighting each question on the PISA the same. And it could matter a lot for the type of rankings that we do um, between, and I don't know, I've looked at it briefly and thought maybe there's a little bit more of a change in the rank ordering in 2015 as a result of what I think is a decent um, modeling change. When it comes to state tests, it's about 50% of tests of states use the Rosh model um, for scaling their end of year exams. And about the other 50% use the 3PL model where they both allow for the discrimination parameter and the guessing parameter. I'm actually not sure why states use different things. Maybe it's a comfort or a discomfort with the full 3PL. Maybe it's related to the size. Um, I think that's a decent example. And then the GRE, here's one last topic that comes up fairly often, works with these things called testlets. So it's adaptive, but it's adaptive at the unit of a testlet, which might be like five items. So the computer decides what five items are you gonna get right away. Then you take those five items, and then based on your performance on those five items, decides what are the next five items gonna be, and it moves on in, in that sort of way. And there's been changes over time about how IRT has been used in, in each of these um, scenarios. As a quick summary, IRT provided or provides a parametric framework for people responding to items, which I think as we've seen can be quite broadly defined. Um, specifically, it puts items and students on the same scale. Um, with that scale, we, can, we know the probability of responses. It allows us to better understand items through the item parameters, should give us a better measurement of the latent construct, and then it helps us to understand the relationship between the latent construct um, and the items. And as a positive byproduct of all of these things, we get good handling of missing data. I didn't say this specifically, but you can just skip over it when you do the item estimation. You just say, it's missing. Um, I just will not include it at all when I do my maximum likelihood estimation. Um, similarly, I can make predictions in the future, if I know your ability and I know the item parameters or I think I know the item parameters from an item, I can tell you what I think the probability is that you'll get that item correct. And then I just talked about a couple of these things, testing for bias, making comparisons between models, um, equating's another really big thing. I have two different tests. If there's at least one or two items that are the exact same on those two different tests, I can equate them, which is essentially to put all of the item parameters for all of the items on a single scale, as opposed to the scale being different for each of the tests. 
Um, here's the learning more slide. So if you want to, yeah, go ahead, hand raise. Yeah, sorry, I have a question about, so um, the GRE adaptive testing thing is super interesting to huh? me, um, but wouldn't that create an issue where you can no longer, you have to like freeze your IRT estimates of questions because then you have a biased sampling of people for each question. So how do you, like you use a uniform test to start and then calibrate or how does that? Yeah, that's an awesome question. My understanding is they do a big validation study where they find a bunch of people to respond to the questions. And then each year, or like basically your item parameters only come from that validation study and then they're fixed through the test and all we're doing is estimating people's abilities as they go through the exam. Um, there is some work talking about how do I update my item parameters while taking into account the selection bias induced by the adaptive algorithm, um, but that's a little bit more of a complicated concept and hasn't really leaked into um, typical industry practice, I don't think. Um, all these slides are online. I think we're just about at time, but the way I learned best was like simulating data or using my own empirical data and then just fitting models to it. I used R. There's a package called MERT, which I think is the most common of people using this that I've seen, but there's certainly other good stuff. Um, there's links here. Uh, there's a decent book, or a pretty good book that I haven't read much, but Mike Frank recommended, um, Item Response Theory for Psychologists. And then People are just recently getting into like fully Bayesian item response models where I can put priors on the discrimination parameters or the guessing parameters, et cetera. Um, and lastly, if you just want a more philosophical view of like, why should we use psychometrics and what benefits does it give us? This Denny Borsboom 2006 article, The Attack of the Psychometricians is actually really, really good and I think readable in an hour or so where he gives basically like, psychometricians have attacked and they need to continue attack so that we stop using the sum score in, in all of our in all of our things. Um, lastly, if you have specific questions to your own use or you want to learn IRT or, or anything, don't hesitate to reach out. You can get me at this email address at, at stenhaug at stanford.edu. Um, and I'll, I'll, of course, leave all the slides and everything online if they're a, a valuable resource. At all. So yeah, thanks so much for your time. Um, fun to meet everyone in a sort of weird remote setting, but I'm, I'm glad we could get together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Goodbye for now. But yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out. I would love to connect with anyone. So. Bye.